the Evolution Security Podcast. Sec throwback episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Evo Sec podcast. I am here once again with my twin brother, Eric Davis. How you doing, man? Man, I'm doing wonderful. Coming off this nice long weekend uh, with with Nick, his family, uh, my grandson for Thanksgiving. Man, it was wonderful. Um, I'm not gonna lie up front. I've got a sinus infection, so for the audience out there, if I sound funky, forgive me, <laughs> especially when I'm enunciating some of my my reading points here. Some, but man, Aaron, it it was an awesome Thanksgiving with family. Uh, how, how about you on Thanksgiving? Man, Thanksgiving is a blast. I I love when Thanksgiving starts because it's the start of this, you know, month long, um, a little over a month long set of holidays that, I mean, it just screams and feels like just family. You know, I really don't care what I get for Christmas. All I care about is taking some extra time off and spending time with my wife and my boys. So, and we have a tradition that we watch a Chris. we start um, Thanksgiving night the first movie is The Christmas Story, or I guess it's called A Christmas Story with Ralphie and his carbine that he wanted to get. And then my wife and I always watch Christmas Vacation as we go to bed. But oh, we, yeah. we literally watch a Christmas movie. We have probably two or three of them that go on throughout the day. We don't just sit there and watch them, but they're constantly going, man. And they're literally the only movies that we have watching, that we have going on through the through the um, time between Thanksgiving and um, Christmas night, so it's a lot of fun. Man, that that does sound fun. Maybe we'll we'll have to institute that. I mean, we watch both those movies. Those are my two favorite Christmas movies. As a matter of fact, just the other evening we were watching part of. Um, National Lampoon's uh, Christmas Story. <laughs> That's just a funny movie, man. You mean Christmas I Vacation? Oh, what did I say? You, you said National Lampoon's Christmas Story. That's wrong, brother. Oh. <laughs> man, that's jacked up. Yes, that's <laughs> the that's the cold medicine talk. <laughs> I had it partially right. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's all right. Well, hey, I just wanted to ask you something. Christmas real- Vacation. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to ask you something real quick. Um, you know, you're talking about your your Thanksgiving time there. And, you know, a lot of people have heard Eric is right there in Special Forces land in Fort Bragg. And, Eric, I was curious, have you ever seen a real live Green Beret eat something that would make a billy goat puke? (laughs) That's hilarious, man. (laughs) I I actually haven't. (laughs) Because I think my Special Forces brethren that are – both in my neighborhood here and uh, and, and on post, <laughs> that's they just don't. That's not a big thing. Of course they they yeah. It's I'm just, just talking about John Rambo and First oh, Blood. He <laughs> Aaron, absolutely. It's it's funny. <coughs> there goes the cough. Um, you know, actually, in my in my craze of reading books. That book I've been intending to to purchase for a while, and, and I knew that's exactly what you're referring to. <laughs> make a billy, and, make a go billy goat puke. Yeah, I, I think uh, most of the the younger men around me here would probably say, "Man, what are you talking about?" <laughs> well, cool. Well, so um, I think Eric, you had something you wanted to read for us. Yeah, Aaron, I I wanted to ask you this. Um, Would you agree that the left likes to frame the the Second Amendment and our armed citizenry as some radical new idea? (laughs) Most certainly in that, that Heller 
changed the way we look at the Second Amendment, that it codified something that had never been believed before, which is a load of crap. It just solidified at least partially, let's just say partially, what we've always known. So, but yeah, yes. they do. They, they they like to act like it's a new thing. And yes, like you said, kind of a fringe deal. Well, and, and, and essentially, it's a radical idea for... Um, for people that don't believe in liberty. So real quick, let me read a piece from chapter one of The Dying Citizen by Vic- Victor Davis Hanson. It's, it's called The Peasants is the Chapter. The idea that without a middle class, there can be little participatory democracy, social tranquility, or cultural stability is not new. It is a poignant lesson from our shared past. The so-called middle ones, or the Masoi in Greek, of ancient Greece, referred to it in the introduction emerged out of the Greek Dark Age, which the Greek Dark Age was between 1150 and 800 BC. As viable farmers of small orchards, vineyards, and grain fields, Legal citizenship in its beginning reflected the growing desires of these small yeoman farmers to protect and pass on to their children their property. That's a novel, that's a novel um, concept, right, Aaron? Property, which we know it isn't, but I think that's an important point. Yes, it is. Land ownership was the perceived font of all these rights and autonomy. Citizenship would have been impossible without this prior material security and independence. The agrarians, or the dragoi, of many Greek city-states were the near majority of the resident population. They also owned and bore their own weapons. By intent, their military-grade arms and armor transcended the need for personal safety and hunting. And I'll stop right there, Aaron. You know, that's what some of the left uses sometimes. You don't need an AR-15 for, for hunting. Well, the, the Second Amendment doesn't, doesn't protect hunting at Not all. Not at all. has nothing to do with it. See, I like that point he makes here. Quite logically... The first citizens of the West soon determined the very conditions under which the city-state's militia marched as hoplite infantry in the phalanx to defend their polis. This revolutionary right of the citizens to bear top-grade arms, currently the most controversial amendment of the American Bill of Rights, and to determine when, where, and against whom they would fight was also synonymous with citizenship at the very beginning of the West. That's pretty awesome, man. That was just after 800 BC. So um, an armed citizenry is not a new concept. It was a concept in Greek antiquity, and it was a foundation for liberty, man. What do you think of that, Aaron? Bro, on the, on the opposite end, it is nothing new to disarm the populace. Exactly. Elites do not trust arms in the hands of the common people. A a good example is, um, I think I brought him up on the last show, isn't it um, de Blasio? Isn't isn't he? He was the governor. He's the mayor mayor. of New York City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry. De Blasio... um, Sean Hannity was asking him, so do you believe it's a right to have a firearm to protect yourself? And he would not answer. And he kept saying, we have police officers that, and one of the best protection apparatuses there is with our police force. Kept asking him, kept asking him. He would not admit that it was a right, that you should be able to have a firearm to defend yourself. And again, that's one of those elites that doesn't like the proles to have their firearms. But of course, 
he's got armed security guards. You know, we've said that stuff before, and you know, but it still bears being said here. Again, that that's what I like to say. I hear that amazing enunciation of of um, the beginning, and and I'm sure it was before that. That was just a codification several thousand years ago of an armed citizenry, and that it was liberty, and it, they were free to do it. But then the opposite, that throughout history, like in feudal Japan, and hey, right before um, World War II, when when Hitler and the Nazis disarmed the Jews. Uh, there's a really good book called Gun Control in the Weimar Republic. Talks all about how they step by step disarm the Jews. You know, again, someone's going to say that's a slippery slope, but hey, 70 years ago is not that long ago. 80 years not, ago. Not at all, Aaron. And, and, and essentially, we know, and that's why I really brought this up, was that the concept in 800 BC or, or, um, or later was about liberty, about protecting their property and being citizens. And, and the, the, the word citizen is, is so much deeper than what we really understand today. And, and really, that's what this was about, was it, it was the beginning of a, the real concept of, of citizenship that, that unfortunately is not understood and upheld today, which we can talk on, an, on another time. But yeah, it, it's amazing to me that um, it, it's misunderstood, and and the left always loves to push down that that uh, narrative of you know the citizens shouldn't be armed, and and they believe that they they would love for us not to be armed because then, frankly, they can implement whatever um, unconstitutional laws um, and not laws because we know they they don't really they pass don't write laws law, anymore yeah. actually. <laughs> It's, they, it's fiat through um, regulation and administrative state, um, you know. Well, Aaron, the, the, the word bureaucracy comes from 18th century French, which means to rule from a desk or an office. Interesting. And, and, and actually so, what, yeah. I, what I meant to say was, was fiat through agencies, Absolutely, yeah. So, which is the current vaccine mandate that's been held up by the courts um, that went through OSHA again, fiat through OSHA, the agency. So, enough about that. But Eric, I am looking forward to hearing this interview with Mike Seeklander. It's so awesome to get to talk to people like Mike. His level of instruction and understanding of how to run a pistol is is sometimes just crazy to to just listen to the depth of his knowledge so you know without further ado let's go ahead and jump into this interview we'd like to welcome mike seeklander to the show for a second time mike how are you doing buddy I'm great, man, and uh, I appreciate you having me back. I, I enjoyed the first time, and let's see what happens this time. Awesome, Mike. Well, you you always bring awesome knowledge, and and you know, again, like we talked pre-show, your guys' support of us has been outstanding, and and, and it's always awesome to talk with you. Um, I'd like to point the audience before we go further. Um, episode 14 of our show, we had Mike on. It's an outstanding show. If you listen to it for any one subject, the discussion on visualization and match prep is well worth your time. So please go back and listen to that. I'll have that in the show notes um, for ease of access. Well, Mike... I, I first of all I'd also like to say that man, it was awesome to finally meet you um, in Tulsa at Clinch Martial Arts. That that was really cool. Appreciate you coming out there and 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 watching us get our butts kicked a little bit. Well, I don't know if I saw any butt kicking too much, too much, man. But I, I enjoyed coming out there, and it, w it was actually a pleasure too because I I guess I didn't put it together that you were going to be there, or maybe you had mentioned it and I didn't realize it that you'd be the exact same time. But uh, 
Uh, it was nice to meet you as well. And uh, it's always nice to see people, you know, in, that are in these inner circles, whatever we want to call them, and actually get to see them in action and, uh, you know, doing the work. And, and that's certainly something you guys do. Well, thanks a lot. It, it, it definitely is doing the work. We, we, we definitely want to walk the walk, the stuff that we espouse. And, you know, we want to make sure we're, we're out there training. It was so cool. Heck, half that, half the clientele there were listeners of our show. So, so it was really cool to, to meet all of them and interact with them. And, and now I'm kind of seeing what you guys go through, you know, when you guys um, put your large events on and, and your camps, it's like really cool the people that that listen to your show and they interact with you just over this medium and, and then to get to meet with them and train with them on the mats and in combatives and all that stuff is super cool. So. Yeah, man, our, we didn't do, we haven't done our warrior camp for a year now or two years because of COVID and all the weirdness. We will, unless something gets crazy, we will be coming back next year. And I, I can't mirror what you said enough. The, uh, the the opportunity to put a face with a name and literally get to be on the range or on the mats or in a room and shake a hand is weird. You know, it's for me, I don't know if, if you experience this, but for me, for years, I did Facebook Lives and you know, I ended up seeing a screen name. I would learn a person by their screen name, and I kind of knew who they were by their screen name. But then when I actually get to put their real name and a face behind the screen name, it's it's weird. It's it's very enjoyable for me. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, Mike Brown, who is a huge um, number one, he's a really good friend of mine, and I still count him as probably the single most important or pivotal person in my in my path not just not that I haven't had other individuals just so impactful but Mike is probably the person number one he built my pistol platform and you know brought me to a high level in IDPA uh, many years ago but he would always give me the next area to work on and and he's really he drove me to dive further into the combatives and the the Shiv Works Collective folks that really shape shaped myself, my brother, and now Brian. And, and you know, I didn't realize it until that day that I had likely not seen, seen Mike since 2003. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and it was really baffling to me. I was like, I can, cannot believe that it's been that long. And it was after I got back um, from Korea and took – another one of his pistol classes. And, and so, yeah, it's like, man, I can't believe it's been that long. So yeah, to have you, both you guys, you, a, a mentor from a distance and Mike being such a mentor and, and getting to be there when we were um, getting some pretty good training was pretty cool. Absolutely, man. <clears throat> well, well, Mike, I'll, I'll go ahead and digress a second. We don't have to have the, the large version, but we definitely need to know, um, for our audience members that may not know, they should know you. But go ahead and give us a, a summary bio, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, boy, and sometimes when I paraphrase this, it sounds like I could never hold, hold down one job because I've, I've gone from thing to thing. But I think the listeners would understand or hopefully understand that I was, I was attempting to go from the, from a thing to the next best thing in my mind. So, um, long story short, grew up out West in Wyoming, uh, joined the Marine Corps in 1990 and spend, uh, for almost six years active duty, did some, uh, Intel work in the Marine Corps and was a PMI primary marksmanship instructor for a while, as well as a reserve cop combat engineer did desert shield and storm, uh, after the Marine Corps, I had a, a huge love of law enforcement and and kind of wanted to get into that. So I did the Knox County Sheriff's Office in Tennessee and then the Knoxville Police Department and then got hired by the Air Marshals right after September 11th, actually in December of 2001, which is weird. That was 20 years ago this December-ish. I think that's the right math. Anyways, did the feds for a while, ran the training program. The, I was the lead handgun instructor for the Federal uh, federal Air Marshal Program and then moved on to FLETC, which is the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Um, now, while I was doing all of those things, I was competing at a pretty high level and eventually became a sponsored full-time, well, let's call it part-time professional shooter because I teach full-time and uh, I develop materials full-time and, and 
compete, I would say, more part-time. But I'm sponsored currently by Wilson Combat. Have uh, a few national titles, uh, one, one IDP world title, uh, one still challenge production world title, technically, I guess, some bug titles. And uh, I compete and fight and shoot and do a bunch of things like that. So I've been doing this for a long time, which is weird. Like you said, you haven't seen certain people for a certain amount of time. I was just at a training venue and met some fams that were not even in the agency when I left. And when they found out who I was, they were kind of say, you know, give me this. Yes, sir. Talking to me like this old dude that had been back in the past of, and I'm like, I guess I was, it was 20 years ago, which is weird. So anyways, that's me in a nutshell. So let's talk about the bigger circle. Um, how did that come about and, and give us a, give us a description of what you guys are doing and we'll hit more details in that. So the, when you hear, when you hear the term, the bigger circle, just full, uh, I guess, introduction to that, that series, we, I, we just, myself, when I say we, Rob Latham, uh, a name, if you're in the shooting world, you should probably know, probably the single greatest handgun shooter of all time. And I filmed great and one. released a video series called the bigger, bigger circle. And the bigger circle concept came from a class we developed Oh, three or four years ago. And the, the concept there is every performance related uh, principle falls in one bigger circle. It, you know, and what we find is people tend to, they tend to hold on to their, their, uh, you know, their venue, they're, okay, I'm a defensive shooter. I'm not a competition shooter or I'm a comp competition shooter. I'm, I'm not really a defensive shooter or I'm a tactical shooter in the military or law enforcement, you know, and it, what you find is when you explore the, the principal techniques utilized to shoot fast and accurately with a handgun, if speed and accuracy are both important to you, they all fall within this, this venue of the bigger circle. So we, we teach a class together. If you're, if you're a cop, law enforcement, you're welcome. If you're a, a competition shooter, welcome. If you're a defensive gun handler, you're welcome, and you will learn how to shoot better. Because the end byproduct all of those shooters, I think, desire is shooting better, shooting faster and more accurately. That's the bottom line. And then we, of course, decided we're going to film the video project, and that was a that was a uh, work in progress for many months now, and it's finally out. You can get it at thebiggercircle.com. And I'm, I, I, I'm proud of everything I've done in terms of video, you know, but I'm really proud of this. Rob and I have a very unique interaction on the video series. We have a very unique interaction in the class. And by the way, we have one class left this year. If you have time, go to Arizona, take the class. You, you will love every minute of it. But it's uh, it's a very unique video series, and I think that uh, I hope it will be the gold standard in high level handgun performance shooting. At least series one, we have some other series in the works as well. So, well, Mike, I would definitely like to unpack quite a bit of this if 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 we can. However, let me comment. You you kind of made me think about my thought process as a little redundant there, but. You guys, number one, your interaction complements each other. You, you guys, number one, are master instructors and teachers. I mean, we'll just use that. I like to use teacher rather than instructor, especially at your guys' level. When you're teaching a technique and, and Rob comes in and says, hey, hey, Mike, can I, can I go ahead and, and – and demo or, or provide some other input is completely complimentary and another way to think of it. And, and being an instructor myself, don't hold a candle nearly <laughs> to you guys. Um, there's so many ways that you can articulate understanding a complex process. And let's face it, maybe shooting in and of itself isn't, overly complex, but there's just so much nuance to understanding being able to shoot in a dynamic setting that you guys are teaching. It, it, it takes people their lifetime to, to master shooting, but then we have guys like you and Rob out there teaching so masterfully that that you guys shorten that um, if people put in put in the work, but but that was the the biggest takeaway I, I get from the videos, and I 
I love video. I think it's one of our most important tools. It cannot replace physical instruction. But the other aspect I got from these videos, it's like you guys just do a great job of of the way the flow of the POI and and the way that you guys demo and the way that you use the visual cue, excuse me, the verbal cues that that makes people get it. And and again, I'm not I'm I'm not near your level. At one point I shot master class in IDPA. I do not shoot that level right now. I concentrate on other things. But I just got so much out of of watching the, these videos, I, you know, I, I hope that doesn't sound overly um, blowing smoke, but it, it, they're outstanding for sure. No, thank you. I, I appreciate you saying that. And I, I don't think you're blowing smoke. And um, I tell you, if uh, you're listening right now and you're wondering, Hey, is this for me? I don't learn a lot from videos. One of the things that, that I have probably not done as good as I should in some of my personal instructional videos is, uh, entertain more. And I, I cringe to say that word because I can't stand entertainment or whatever the word it is. You know, where yeah. folks are just literally putting cannon fodder junk on YouTube or Instagram just to be a talking head and to get likes and views, right? But there's a certain element where when you're watching a video, it's the same reason you'll go and watch a video series on, you know, Hulu or Netflix uh, because you enjoy the entertainment of that series. And one of the things about Rob and I is our interactions. It's very unique, I believe. And the videos are not very informative, but they're also very entertaining. And the, the way the video is done is it was shot in a class setting. These are volunteer students, but they're actual students. So that allows us to do things we couldn't do in a standard video series. And, uh, you know, there's some things we, we might have done different in the, in the future if you give us a future opportunity, like we will do a, probably a series two. But, well, I think in the end, the product was uh, very well done. And I think people will love it when they watch it. They'll really enjoy the process of learning from the video series. Oh, absolutely. And, and for the audience out there, I'll just, you know, hit on a few of the subjects and maybe we can um, talk in, in more detail. So, I mean, just like any, I will just call it defensive slash competition dynamic firing from the holster type of, of, of shooting POI or program of instruction, you're going to get grip stance, you know, structure. You're going to get a huge section on trigger management, which I, I really want to talk heavily on that. Um, you guys go over, of course, multiple reloads from a defensive standpoint, a competition standpoint, um, multiple ways of releasing a slide, um, giving the, the shooter permission to decide which one that they want to use. Off-balance shooting, of course, one-handed shooting, the draw stroke. Um, this, so those are, those are the, 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 I would say, the broad subjects but you of course go through so much more that that we can't really cover on the air because it it'd be a five-hour show but one of the things that i'd really like to talk about is is the trigger management section and you know i i think there's this in the shooting community especially for let's let's just call it newer shooters or just recreation shooters I think there's this understanding that there's just kind of one trigger press. And then once you try to go fast, you're trying to emulate that same trigger press. Maybe that's not a very good description, but you guys, you guys totally blow out of the water, the jerking, the trigger, you know, aspect. And you, you then I'll say this before I ask you the question is you go from, contact distance all the way out to 50 yards and very distinct distinctly describe what your focus is going to be how you're pressing the trigger and i mean just outstanding way of putting that together but can you two two things can you hit on that regarding the a little bit about from contact distance out to 50 
and also can you can you hit on the 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 sacred cow of don't jerk the trigger can hmm. we start there maybe so yes and I, I, i'll try not to get terribly wordy but this is an audio show so i'm, I'm hoping people are comfortable listening and able to absorb what i'm about to say because it's important so that to hit any given target, we have to do three things. We have to stop the gun on the target, right? We have to verify alignment in some way, shape, or form. And I, I didn't just say focus on the front sight. So be careful what you hear because sometimes what we hear is not often what is actually said. I said we have to verify alignment in some way, shape, or form. Then we have to fire the gun without moving it. So firing the gun without moving it is, essence, in essence, trigger management. So one of the things we talk about in the series is you know, there are elements to the trigger. For example, you know, there's some slack before you get to what we would describe as the wall. We call that prepping or going to the wall. Uh, the actual aspect of firing the gun and pressing through that wall is, you know, is, is the mechanic that allows you to fire the gun. That uh, is the single, probably most important part of the trigger management process in terms of accuracy. And then the rest of the process is simply resetting the trigger and getting ready to fire again. The reset process is the single most important factor in terms of speed itself, right? Uh, if you want to shoot fast, you have to be able to reset the trigger fast and get ready to fire again fast. Here's where we have it wrong, though. And anybody that says, well, you jerk the trigger, you slap the trigger, and that's why you missed, should stop and think about that for just a minute. Think about this for a second. So we're holding a handgun with one or two hands. And we're supporting the handgun in theory with a standard grip, which means you have three fingers in your palm on the grip of the handgun. The trigger finger is therefore in contact with the trigger. And you're going to tell me that by slapping the trigger or jerking the trigger, the trigger finger with its strength is overpowering the other three fingers in the entire hand. No, that's not the case. The, pre the people miss because they move the gun. It has absolutely nothing to do with jerking or slapping the trigger. Now, I will tell you, uh, some shooters and new shooters that jerk or slap the trigger are, in essence, jerking or slapping the trigger. And the end result is a miss on the target. But guess what? The miss was not caused necessarily by the jerk or the slap. The miss was caused by the process of moving the gun out of the desired aiming point or hitting point, I should say, before the bullet exits the barrel. That's the bottom line. Uh, and if you think about this, uh, if we talk about the slack or the prep point, that's getting ready for the trigger to fire, the press is actually firing the gun. What is faster, a slow press or a fast press, or we could even describe that as a slap press, which means we're literally slapping the trigger as fast as we can move our finger. Well, we, we all know the answer. You have to. In, in, if you measure the time, the slap or, the, or call it whatever you want. You call it jerk. You call it a slap. You can call it an accelerated pull. You can call it a, 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 a push through a atomic bomb. I don't care. It doesn't matter what it is. But the point is, assuming the gun doesn't move, the speed we fire it has nothing to do with missing. Assuming the gun doesn't move. And you have to, if you remember anything I just said, listen to me one more time. If the gun doesn't move, you can pull the trigger any way you want and still hit the shot, which is why in, in the advanced shooting mechanics series, we talk so much about structure from the ground up because even I, I, I shoot and teach advanced shooters from, you know, military and law enforcement to co competitive shooters. Everybody, I've had everybody, anybody who's anybody out there is my student. And I still see high level shooters violate structure principles that allow their body to be moved by the gun or allow their hand to move the gun when they fire it uh, in, in the end result, missing a shot or missing what they're trying to hit. So that's, you know, kind of in a nutshell where we go on trigger management. Of course, we get into the nuts and details in terms of trigger finger position, trigger finger distance, what should move on your trigger finger, what shouldn't move on your trigger finger. And like you said, we could talk for two hours on that. Well, and, and, and I've, I've got my cert pistol here with me right now, which you guys used a lot in, in, in the video. And so when I, I just for the audience, I, I can describe several of the drills that Mike and Rob have um, the students go through. One of them, you mentioned the accelerated pull. And I may be conflating a couple of the drills. Um, 
but for the audience out there, Mike and Rob go through various stages in teaching how to manage that trigger, um, not just a slow press, but a very fast accelerated press. And you guys, and I've seen a drill similar to this, Mike, and I've done some of it myself, but just the way that you guys taught it um, just made a lot more sense to me. But if the audience can't see this on, on, uh, on video right now, but but the students or clients in the class are starting with their finger all the way uh, touching the trigger guard before they even start the, the pressing of the trigger. And Mike and Rob have the students go through, okay, they're going to aim. And then when you guys said fire, they're pressing all the way through as fast as possible. And you guys are showing them that, um, that, that as long as their structure is solid, their, their, their stance or grip, you know, proper grip pressure, and they're just accelerating through that press, and you're proving to them that they can do that within reason and still not not miss. Now, of course, there's also opportunities that you guys do awesome when you find some of the students that need some help, and you and you stop and you you start to correct and coach that um, again brilliantly and help correct the problem. So again, to describe to the audience, this is some of the information that you're going to get out of this video. That's just outstanding. Sure. Yeah. And I, you know, if you uh, are uh, one of my members, I have two membership areas, competitive and defensive, you know, AWS coin members and ACSS. And I, I talk about the accelerated and the control pull. And we have great content. I have great content, but one of the things that I didn't have was a second, you know, student or a second instructor or a, a second person to interact with on some of those videos. So in these videos, I think one of the, the, the hidden gems is the live fire coaching because every video has uh, a lecture, uh, uh, several drills, and then a full live fire coaching segment where you watch us run the students through the drills and coach and give individual students feedback. And Rob and I are both doing that. We have a camera on each of us. That, I think, is probably the gold nugget for most shooters, especially advanced shooters that, that have quite a bit of experience to see that happen. Oh, it's it's excellent. I, I learned a ton um, from just watching you guys coach and just uh, cues and mental cues for myself and, frankly, as a, as a trainer myself, in ways that I can articulate things better. And I also have to digress a second. I want to make sure that even though I described that one trigger press drill, you guys also then bring it all together to where when you're shooting fast, you guys are very much articulating that you're still taking up the wall and then pressing through um, the rest of the trigger press quickly. And that's that's the controlled um, trigger drill, correct? The controlled trigger press, correct? I might yeah. have the... Exactly. Yeah. So we 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 have we use the names that I've used in my previous videos. We call one method an accelerated trigger pull. Uh, the other is the controlled trigger pull. And and those you know full disclosure those those terms actually came about many 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 years ago with uh, Phil Strader, a buddy and I were actually teaching a class and we decided to label the trigger pulls and he said, well let's call them. Well we're calling this controlled. I said something like, well let's call it a controlled competition pull or CCP and one was an ACP an accelerated competition pull or whatever, something to that effect. Phil and I were teaching a class. And then later on, I just called them controlled pull and accelerated pull, meaning that with an accelerated pull, we're literally pulling the trigger as fast as we can and not moving the gun. With a controlled pull, we're taking the time, you know, to take the slack out of the trigger, go to the wall, only because the alignment process is still happening. So the only time we're going to use a controlled pull, if you're hearing this right now, is if I'm still aligning the gun, like figuring out if the dot is where it needs to be or the front and rear sight target relationship or what they need to be. So if, the, if I'm aligning the gun, if it's that hard of a shot, I'm going to use a control pull. If not, I'm going to push right through the trigger. Yeah, and then you guys go again, kind of, kind of hitting back on what we kind of talked about earlier is how that process works from various di distances as well. Even though it's the same, the, the, the concentration points are, are, are slightly different, especially at 25 or 50 yards, how that process works. And you guys teach it excellent in, in the videos. But yeah, had, you know, just to add, a, can I add, a, I want to. 
Absolutely. It's just a, a naysayer point. Someone is thinking, well, it's easy to do on those competition pistols or 1911s or whatever. Here's the bottom line. I, the principles are exactly the same. I don't care if you have a two pound trigger or a 12 pound trigger. The principles are the same. I will certainly admit we all understand everyone that has ever shot a gun knows that a two pound trigger is easier to pull than a 12 pound trigger. However, the principles are the same. I can accelerate through a 12 pound trigger. I can accelerate through a two pound trigger. It's going to be slightly easier for me to accelerate through a two pound trigger or three pound trigger, which is why we shoot lower, lighter triggers on competition guns. But don't, you know, if you're in your mind thinking right now, or maybe you tell this someone you heard this on a podcast and they're on naysayer, well, it can be done on competition pistols, but it doesn't work on the carry gun, the baloney. That's baloney. That's wrong. Absolutely. It's not a fact. Yeah, great, great point, Mike. And, and the reason I'm spending a lot of time on the trigger portion is because, frankly, especially newer shooters, they're going to be concerned about the whole facet, you know, hey, I'm trying to learn how to draw correctly. I'm trying to learn how to to reload the pistol. Um, you know, I'm trying to get all this stuff done quickly. Obviously, that's super important. What, what I will say is, is if you're under the the proper tutelage of a of a good instructor, and they teach you draw stroke, they teach you the efficient methodologies of reloading a pistol, whatever type of reload it is, you can do that and dry fire and and if you put the work in you're going to master that i think the hardest thing for all shooters to master is what we're talking about and that's the pressing of the trigger and and what you guys are are i'm teaching it just is is a really good way to get people on that right path correctly sure i, I agree it's it is the it, it is in essence shooting you know when we finally brought the gun and stopped the gun on target Verified alignment to fire it requires, you know, that we, we I, you know, I always say, and I like to tell my students, good trigger control is good grip control. That's that's what it is. Awesome. So assuming, you know, you're doing your job with your trigger control is good grip control by not moving the gun. So Awesome. Great, great, great axiom there. And that's the other thing I was going to bring up two things. You guys quote, or excuse me, state, pardon me some awesome axioms for, for all facets of, of this dynamic shooting platform. And at the end of every single video, you guys have awesome summary notes yep. that like if to me, what I've been doing, I'm sitting here looking at, um, at my notebook from, from watching the videos. And I made it a point to write down, those summary notes after every video that, that I, and I'll full disclosure, I haven't been able to watch every single video. I just got it Sunday and I wanted to spend time on all of it, but I, I take the time to write down those exact statements because there's so much mental cue in those, in those summary notes that, that are, that are awesome. That, that again, I, I, I think it's very important for especially newer shooters and advanced shooters alike that the the mental side of understanding the process is one of the hardest parts. W would you agree yeah. with that, Mike? I do. Yeah, I, I completely understand that. And and not only that, but the, the 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 problem, the mental side comes from the fact that there's also a significant amount of confusion out there. You yes, know, exactly. A, a, lot, a, a huge number of instructors or so called instructors are doing students a disservice by just repeating what they've always heard. Uh, they're, I call them I call them parrot instructors. They're parroting what they've already heard. They're not exploring. They're not able to really give their students the why behind the details. You know, if you ask me about different trigger management methods or maybe different diff, different grip, grip pressure descriptions, I can break down the extreme detail of those things because I've explored them. And I didn't accept any truth until I had experimented as far as I could go with that that process. And I'm still experimenting. And I think that's why the new shooter, you know, has trouble sometimes because they don't really know what or who to listen to. And then number two, they're trying to wrap their head around this whole thing that is a simple process in theory to say or to teach. It's not an easy process to do. And it requires 
you know, some fine-tuned myelination, some skill sets. I mean, you're, I believe, a, a musician. I mean, right. you know, reps as it take to, to hit a drum set or strum a guitar or whatever else and do those fine details. And the end user just hears the music, and they're like, oh, it's beautiful music. They don't have any appreciation for what it takes to accomplish and, and make that music. And, uh, and if you're a new shooter listening to this, just it's just it's a fun road you're you're down but you got to take your time you know and make sure you're exploring and understanding the principles first and then you have to you have to do the repetitions can't buy skill can't you can't wish it happens tomorrow it's not gonna you know so. yeah even 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 understanding those mental cues and 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 understanding the process you hit it on the head you have to do the work and you, you mentioned music you know i'm sitting here you may see on video here behind me are my drums, and I actually started coining it um, my dry fire practice for my drumming, um, just as a way, a new way to think about my rudiment work. Because full disclosure, I've played drums for years. I mean, since my brother um, uh, Aaron and I have been playing in bands together since we were young teenagers, and I went in and out of playing drums. Well, just in the last three years or so, have I had a renaissance in that? And one of the most crucial things that you can do for your drumming is rudiment work mm -hmm. on a practice pad. And it's to most people, it can be boring. I'm sitting down with a metronome and I'm working on single stroke. I'm working on double. I'm working on paradiddles. I'm working on six stroke rolls. I'm working on all these basic rudiments, but I, but if you're not doing that, just like within shooting, you're not going to master it. And, That's right. and so you bringing that up made me thought, I think I was, I was going to bring that because I call that my dry fire practice in my drumming. You know, I sit down sometimes and just do rudiments and it's made a huge difference in my playing. So good, good point bringing that up, Mike. All right, let's take a moment and talk about one of our awesome sponsors, which is Keeper's Concealment. They are the original authority on appendix holsters and appendix training. They offer high-performance handgun training, specializing in concealed carry performance. I just have to say that I took and highly recommend Spencer's AIWB class. It is full of info how to set up your appendix rig from the proper holster with the proper features all the way to the clothes that you wear. An excellent class that you should take if and when you get a chance. Also, Keeper's Concealment is a proud affiliate of CCW Safe, the truly proven legal service membership company offering dedicated legal defense Heaven forbid you are forced to use lethal force. Now use code KC10OFF. That's KC10OFF. And check them out at ccwsafe.com forward slash keepers. And also to buy a holster, sign up for a class, inquire about hosting a course, or join CCW Safe. You'll find all that you need at keepersconcealment.com. You know, one of the other things that I think that I'm going to continue to get out of of these videos, you, you hit it on the head as I get a I get a kick out at the jokes that you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and you guys will do these replays, it, like like you or or Rob will will say something, and you guys will stop the video replay and it'll slow down. <laughs> It's it's hilarious. I, I I dig it for sure. <laughs> yeah, we 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 did want to have some entertainment factor. We wanted our viewers to have fun, just like in our class, our students have fun. They have a blast in three day class, and we wanted our viewers of the video series to have fun as well. So, well, where where is the uh, location in Arizona? Uh, Excuse me. It's actually uh, Casa Grande. So you know you would fly to Phoenix, but the actual range we're using is in Casa Grande. Oh, you know, I took the um, range master instructor development class there mm -hmm. um, last year, and so I'm assuming I bring him up on there. Is uh, Chris Lapre hosting yep. you guys? That's right. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He, he and uh, his buddy uh, uh, Brian down there. 
So, man, Chris is an awesome dude and a and a really good shooter too. Yeah, um, really great dude. That's cool. I what what date is it or what dates? We are doing class. I will pull it up for you real quick. Uh, it's not very far away. It's going to be two weeks away. The weekend. Uh, it's the nineteenth to the twenty first of November. Oh wow! All right. And you guys have slots still open? We do. Not many though. There are, I think, only five, maybe six, seven slots left. Well, hopefully, this might help them fill them up. I'm seeing if I can clear my calendar. I can't guarantee it because I actually am on some TDY. Maybe I can. Maybe I can make that happen. Now, you got sure. if if that doesn't work out. Um, are you guys going to be doing that class um, sometime in the first year? Or? We are. Yeah, I don't know the dates yet. Rob and I will sit down and talk about the dates. We actually have a bunch of requests now. They're they're starting to build up, so we'll see what we do next year. But yes, there will there will absolutely be several bigger circles class series next year as well. So well, awesome. Well, I I I guarantee you this. Um, myself and Aaron. And possibly Brian, we will make it to that class if it not be um, this upcoming class. Um, it's now become the top of my um, my list for classes. So very um, cool. It, I'll, I'll definitely be in it um, as soon as I can. So one one of the reasons we started this business <laughs> was to help pay for training. Right. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Well, Mike. Um, Let's talk a little bit about uh, jujitsu and combatives in in the training community. And this is a subject that's on my mind a lot. And I think sometimes it's easy for myself and 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 the people just like yourself um, and all the the folks that we train with and that we interact with that we're friends with. You know, we might have a skewed thought process on the acceptance of combatives and integration in in uh, this community and i want so i've been asking a lot of trainers this do you think that there is a growing acceptance specifically in the firearms community to to more combatives and uh and, and training and integrated um, you know, such as, you know, bringing in the, the scenario-based training, the jiu-jitsu, the weapons-based grappling stuff. Do, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I don't know, man. I, you know, to be honest, in terms of that subject, I, I think that, well, let's, uh, in, in the broader view, I think that we're seeing acceptance in certain areas. I'll, I'll go across several, actually. I'll get outside of your little, your box here. First of all, I think, I think the defensive and tactical minded shooters are embracing competitive shooters and techniques and competition that's happening. Uh, I think the defensive shooters out there that are serious about defending themselves are starting to embrace combatives. Um, some of them, some of them might've been introduced to, you know, what we would call gun grappling or integrated weapons combative integrated combatives there's a lot of different terms for it mm. i think they're starting to understand the importance of that the serious student of the game of the game is already doing that they've been doing that for a while but i do think the people that are a little less serious understand the importance of learning some small things i, I do think the average person though uh if you look at bjj as a whole jiu-jitsu as a whole and mma you know in the public now a, a lot of people do it. So it, at, at a minimum, it, let's just assume that this average gun-carrying defensive shooter does train BJJ somewhere and has never done integrated you know, grappling and combatives with, with a weapon. He's still ahead of someone that's never done any kind of BJJ or combatives. Um, I, will, I will tell you, though, I'll, I'll flip that on the other side, though, and shout out to all you BJJ fighters that – probably aren't listening to this podcast because if you listen to this podcast, you're probably a shooter too. But I, I think there's a bigger base of BJJ fighters and trainer people that train that don't and haven't embraced the firearm and, and the edge weapons and less lethal areas of self-defense that they should. I wrote an article a long time ago. It was don't bring jujitsu to a gunfight. Uh, and it was just, you know, to point out that, yeah, you might be a black or brown belt and that's an incredibly high level 
and end up in a store and be eight yards away from someone that comes in with a shotgun and have nothing that you can do because guess what? Jiu-jitsu is not going to solve the problem then and there, you know, unless you can get to contact range. So um, I don't know if I answered your question, man, because I don't know if there's any way for us to answer it. I think and I would hope that all of these cultures of self-defense cultures are starting to embrace the other facets of that. You know, that's why we started the whole American Warrior Society was to try to introduce people that self-defense is a big pot. It's a big stew. You know, you can't make stew with just chunks of meat. You got to make stew with some broth and some meat and some carrots and some potatoes and maybe some seasoning. You know, you need a little bit of everything to be a good defender. Well, Mike, you just hit it on the head, and I was actually going to bring that point up, is that American Warrior Society and what you and Rich have been doing, both with the podcast and and your business, I think is a big part of that. I, I, I We said it the last time we had you on, you guys are a big reason why we decided to do this because we felt like, okay, for for our little piece and where the areas that we are, I think it's so important for this networking piece to take place. And and so, yeah, I, I, that's why I've been asking that question quite a bit lately because I know that my my mindset may be a little bit skewed, but I think you did exactly, you answered the question very well and I, I think it meets my perspective yeah. for sure and you know, <clears throat> go ahead can I just to add a thing here and I don't hold people like I, I don't judge people or I try right. not to judge people because we're we're too much in it to be judging other people because let's say you're brand new to this and and, and something bad happened to you or you think something bad might happen and you you begin this journey you might respond to me who says well Man, you gotta you gotta get a gun. You gotta learn a gun. And you gotta learn gear. And you gotta do this. You gotta draw. And you gotta dry fire. And you gotta go to classes. Then you gotta maybe start in some MMA or combative training. You know, BJJ or whatever else. And oh, then you gotta integrate and buy a you know a red gun or a cert pistol and integrate. And then oh, do you carry a knife? Do you have any idea how to use a knife? And oh, by the way, a great solution so you don't have to shoot someone is to spray them with pepper spray. So the the point there is it's it's really a very dedicated journey for someone that's yes. brand new. I don't blame them for being overwhelmed, you know, and that's why we talk about skill prioritization, you know, like going, okay, what is going to make me the safer, safest, the soonest in the environment I'm in and, and start to approach and attack that. And then, you know, if everything's a priority, nothing is. So focus not just on one thing at a time, but not 10 things at a time and focus on plugging the holes that are, you know, beating the alligators that are closer, close to the boat for lack of a better term. So if you're hearing this or someone hears this or forwards this to you and, and you feel a little guilty because you're not doing everything or you're a shooter, you're not doing BJJ or you're BJJ guy and you're not doing shooting or you've never done self-defense with a knife, relax, take your time, you know, research and find great instructors and, and don't waste a minute of your time. I talked to Rich on our, our Monday show, the E versus E ratio, entertainment versus education. So if you're spending too much time on entertainment well guess what you need to pare that down and spend more time on educational stuff videos right. and training and classes and whatever else so. yeah that that's excellent way to put it mike and and you're correct we had a discussion with john valentine on our just recently released uh, show and and i admitted on that show that you know i started beating up on myself if nearly every day I wasn't dry firing, going to jujitsu, lifting or cardio and and you know, once or twice a week shooting. I was actually starting to mentally bring myself down. Yes. Because exactly. because I wasn't because <clears throat> I mean, you have a day job, you know, you try and, and for a long time I was keeping that up and then I realized it's like there's no way I can carry that on for perpetuity. And frankly, Mike, I heard you talk about it one time where, um, and I don't want to, you know, think that I'm quoting you, but I do believe I remember you saying that you felt it was hard for you to stack all of what we, what we try to accomplish in one day. And, and maybe you can hit on that, your thoughts on that. Cause, cause I definitely got to where I'm like, okay, I'm going to, to jujitsu today. I might've worked out in the morning, but you know what? 
I may not dry fire today. I may dry, you know, I have a schedule, don't get me wrong. Right. But but there's times where I'm like, okay, I'm going to let let myself have a mental break here. I'm just going to read some fiction for for a while, you know. So Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Uh, I, I think that's super important, especially if you're in the the area that we that you and I personally in, but maybe the listeners too. I think people that listen to your show or the American Warrior show or we, a lot of us are like-minded. We're from the same culture. Uh, I, I don't, I don't believe anybody puts uh, uh, as much training in. The average person doesn't have the time to do it anywhere near the level I do. I understand that, but you know, but at the same time, I'm, I, I'm not a fan of making life harder and beating ourselves up. If we, like you said, well, I, man, I did, I did some cardio today, and I should have lifted, and then I want to go to beach day tonight, and crap, I'm supposed to do a dry fire set. And there's a point where where you can't accomplish it all. So I found that for me, the very best way to stay on a really great training cycle that I love is to separate separate the skills. So for example, my week currently is as follows, and it, it just shifted. Because now I'm out of the competitive season, so I'm shooting a little less. So now I will be shooting, for example, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, right? And, and they're not mandatory. If I get bad weather or a family event, okay, then I'll shoot one day that week. Uh, I, I do try to handle my gun another couple times, short dry fire session, unload the gun, do presentations, whatever. doesn't matter what it is. Uh, and then three days a week, I'm doing, you know, BJJ, okay? Now, the two days a week that I go to the range after my range session or maybe before my range session, depending on what I'm focusing on, that's when I'm adding in some additional strength work. Obviously, if I'm rolling on the mats for 40 minutes or 45 minutes, I'm getting cardio. Uh, I mean, I do, you know, a pretty hard class with my group. So uh, and then, you know, then I'll do maybe a recovery thing in, you know, on the weekend day. And I think by alternating those things, if you, because I could, I could go to BJJ every single day of the week and I could go to the range as soon as I changed and got done, but I mentally wouldn't want to do it. I'd be so burned out and so sick of it. It wouldn't make any sense. Now, the average listener may say, Mike, that's five days a week. I've worked. Well, okay, then maybe that's not what you're doing. Maybe you are doing two evening classes a week, right? And maybe two workouts a week in the gym and you end your workout with, 50 reps of dry fire, presentations, loads, malfunction clearances, and that's it. And then on Saturday, if you're feeling really good, go for a recovery run. So yeah. you can find a way to balance this. And I know you may have to cut down on your entertainment a little bit and increase your education time, but that's the bottom line. Anybody can do that. There's nobody that I've met that, that can't do that. Uh, and so, you know, I really believe that's, I think my training system is, is the best I've ever had it. Like where I'm recovered as much as I can at my age and my skills are continuing to increase every single week. No, that's, that's great, Mike. And, and interestingly enough, my schedule is very, very close to yours. As, although I do not shoot as much as you, um, I, I'm kind of focusing a little more on jujitsu um, cause so a lot of my time I'm spending researching, I'm doing a lot of video work and I, and I'm at jujitsu about three times a week and, you know, but I'm also still fitting in. I, I work out in the morning two to three times a week and, and I'm getting in, I, honestly, I used to try to dry fire every day, but that's another one of those things. It's like, right. I, I am dry firing three times a week. That's that's so I fit it in between those days, and and yeah, it, that's kind of the way my schedule is right now. Yeah, and I, one I'll, I'll, one last tip I would tell your listeners: if you're hungry for something, maybe you're really into shooting now, but you've done BJJ for a couple of years, that's fine. Then dry fire five days a week and shoot as much as you can afford ammo. If you're hungry for it, your brain is telling you now is a great time for skill development. It's primed to develop and learn. Or maybe the opposite is true. You, you've been shooting for a while and, and once a week would maintain. The average person, if you're shooting once a week, you are so far ahead of 99% of the gun owners out there. You are fantastic. And maybe you're really hungry for jiu right now. Go for it. Do what you're hungry for, but but don't negate anything else. You know, uh, Don't negate your fitness. Don't negate your at least medical awareness. Where's your IFAT kit? When's the yeah. last time you took it out and 
got your tourniquet and actually practice putting it on, you know, without mm-hmm. making food. Take, take the other, take the other aspects in the maintenance sure. mode. Right. Yeah. Um, right. And exactly. pe- periodization, especially at, at, you know, I'm, I'm close to 50 now. Um, periodization is big for me right now. I'll go through, um, cardio cycles for my workouts and do a maintenance lifting. And then like right now I'm doing, um, uh, lifting and a maintenance cardio session. So yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'd like to see this, I, I hear you and Rich talk about it. Um, Cecil's real good about emphasizing this because we are talking about a lot that can overwhelm, um, folks newer to this path is simply choose one of those espoused yeah. methods and choose it and start. Sure. And then just start adding, you know, you know, I, I think you would agree, you know, if people are starting on this path, probably they need to focus on fitness at first, yes, you know, absolutely. add, add some, add some, you know, take a, a pistol class and start adding some dry fire in, you know, or maybe you want to start jujitsu now, or, or even just, you know, take one of Cecil's classes, expose you to Cecil Birch, that is expose you to some clinch and some jujitsu, you know, just start with one of them and just add a little bit at a time and, and it won't be so overwhelming. Yep. I agree. Well, Aaron, let's talk about origin, man. Origin supports the path we are all on with the best jujitsu geese on the market, rash guards, spats, and after workouts, Jocko fuel supplements like milk protein, krill oil, and joint warfare help us recover. And Aaron, I'll stop there. The Jocko um, cold warfare has been in my regiment every day since I got this sinus infection. And I honestly think that's been a big factor in helping me feel better with all the vitamin C, D, and minerals that are in that, that help my... Uh, my uh, immune system. Goodness I'll, gracious. I'll tell you what, cold warfare, that hasn't been on my radar. Man, I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's good stuff, man. So earlier this week, um, a couple of my my buddies at Jiu-Jitsu approached me about um, making a gi and, and uh, rash guard order. So I've got this big order for this week for all of us, including myself, I'm going to go ahead and throw on a, a, a path. Gi. You know, my buddy, Chris, he, he brought in his path. Gi. And Aaron, that's the first time I've actually, you know, touched and checked out the path. Gi. Incidentally, it, it is a lot softer and lighter weave than the Jocko Def Gi, which is supposed to be the same, the same weave, but I think they've changed quite a bit. And so, man, I, I, now I get what you're getting at, man. It's that that gi is something else, and it's not that expensive either. It's so, not, and and that's interesting that you say that because I thought that that your def gi was a little bit rougher, and then when I got mine, absolutely. I was like, man, this thing's luxurious. But it, hey, isn't it isn't it cool that we are an affiliate with them and and we're able to sell their products, and then also people that also get to their our affiliate link there um, and they get direct from them that helps us out too oh absolutely aaron thank you for mentioning that so please if you're interested in any of origins products please go to our show notes or our website on our blog post and find our affiliate links and if you decide that you want to support us Get something on there. It helps us out big time. Use EvoSec10 at checkout for 10% off. Well, you know, Mike, you you actually kind of hit on two of the questions I was going to ask anyway. So, man, you you knocked like two two questions out of the park. <laughs> so, so we are kind of getting to the close of the of the show. So now let's hit a little red meat for our, our folks out there that like gear, if you don't mind. Sure. What, what's your current carry that you're using right now? Let, and, and let's talk about less lethal too. little specifics. Yeah. So, um, uh, I actually, I actually have my carry gun on the desk here, uh, unloaded and clear. Won't manipulate it much, but this is an EDC nine. I carry an EDC nine or a Wilson combat, uh, 
compact CQB, typically a smaller aluminum frame. And let me, let me, you know, full disclosure to the listeners, I'm sponsored by Wilson Combat, uh, but I also compete primarily in 1911 style divisions. So I try to carry the same family of gun that I competed. If I shoot 30,000 rounds a year with a 1911, it makes sense I carry a 1911. Absolutely. I, uh, as far as reliability, I know everybody tries to get on Instagram and a reliable 1911. Hey, listen, if you're saying that, then you you, you haven't shot a lot of the current top level manufacturer 1911s. And I'm not talking about just Wilson Combat. Look at the Springfields that are out there. Look at some of the other companies that are building 1911s. Look at STI and some of their lower cost ones. Certainly Wilson Combat is, 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 is you know, they're pricier. You get what you pay for. But mine are 100%. They run all the time. They are about as close to 100% as any gun I've ever owned. And I don't know any gun that I've owned that hasn't ever had a malfunction. Uh, so I typically carry a handgun uh, uh, in a precision holster, ultra appendix waistband or inside the waistband holster. Uh, I spare mag pouch. I got about 20 rounds total on me. I've got a, a wave opening spider co folding blade in my strong side pocket. Sometimes I'll carry one of my support hand or support side, not always be my left side. Uh, a Surefire uh, stiletto with these new flat flashlights. One of the guys at Surefire, uh, Andy sent me this fantastic light. I'm not sponsored by Surefire, just a fantastic, excellent everyday carry light. Um, I don't normally carry pepper spray on my person like every day, uh, but like I have a bunch of, like I have a pepper spray in each of the door components of my car. I have one Velcroed near the gear shift as, as well as a couple other things. And then like when I'm, if I'm downtown or a weird area or have to move from the vehicle to a restaurant, I'll typically unvelcro that. I'll carry that in my hand, you know, some standard, you know, uh, it's, a uh, it's a pepper stream, not a, not a foam or not a gel. It's the standard stream handheld one made by, uh, uh, and I'm, uh, drawing a blank at the name of the company. It's pretty prominent that's okay. pepper spray company. So that's my, my normal carry. Always have a lot of money. Always have a gun, always have an edge weapon. If I can legally do so, I guarantee I have those things on me. Uh, nice. A couple of spare mags in the car. And uh, sometimes I'll have a rifle in the car as well. So there you go. Because we we carry a pistol because we can't conceal a rifle, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the interesting thing is I can do a lot with a pistol that might be difficult with the rifle. I think the average person are, is going to – I think they would have a harder time fighting and defending a rifle in a close quarter situation than they would maybe with a handgun, believe it or not. So. Oh, absolutely. It's why, and, and, and I can't speak from experience. I'm not a, I'm not an operator, never was as a soldier myself. Um, but yeah, that's, that's why a lot, a lot of folks, I'm sure, including yourself sometimes is sling the rifle and, and the pistols out, um, in close quarter situations. So certainly something that that's very, uh, understandable that sometimes that the, the tactics and the techniques change do dictated by the environment, right? Sure. Absolutely. Well, Mike, that's, that's great. And, and, you know, you reminded me something last night when I was, when I was transitioning between my jujitsu gym and my car I was actually driving my wife's car at the time, got good gas mileage, you know, with the current gas prices, I'm not driving my truck as much. Um, but, you know, it's that transitional space that, you know, we, we always need to be aware of. And you mentioned your pepper spray. It's like that was a, an instance where I had to park and there was no illumination in this good portion of the backside of the parking lot. And I, and I, I took my pepper spray out because it's like, you know, and I, in those instances when especially in transitional space that, that pepper spray can be very valuable tool and and you know for our audience out there sometimes those are the times where we really need to be cognizant sure. of that stuff so well very cool mike well listen i've taken enough of your time and and we've got a lot of great content on this show i really greatly appreciate your time and uh, and your wisdom and your mentorship and and I can't wait for us to get in uh, this this bigger circle class uh, again. It's it's now on the top of my um, shooting class list for sure. Sweet, yeah. Well, you'll enjoy it. Uh, it's it, it's a great class. I, I think anybody who takes that class would would leave enjoy having enjoyed and learned 
uh, and a, a large amount of material. So, oh, I guarantee it. I, I'll go on record to say that I think it it's probably. It's going to be one of the best shooting courses that people are ever going to get the chance to to take. I, just from what I see from it, and and I've taken a lot of classes about shooting on shooting mechanics and 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 competition and tactical. And I think uh, and again, just like you guys said at the v- beginning of the video, doesn't matter the arena, the shooting's still the same. Sure, absolutely. So man. so cool. Well, listen, Mike, you have a blessed evening. And uh, we'll certainly love to have you on a third or fourth time if you if you have the time. So um, have a blessed evening and enjoy the family, okay? Thank you, folks. And thanks, folks, for listening. And uh, stay safe out there. And I will add towards the end, I will have all Mike's contact information in the show notes as well. Have a good one, Mike. Thanks. Well, Aaron, I think it's about that time for a little bit of accountability. So this week was kind of a unique week for me and probably for you as well with uh, Thanksgiving. So had a little bit of an abbreviated set of workouts, but still got after it. Um, I had two uh, home gym workouts. I had one hour long functional cardio workout, uh, mixing rowing, treadmill, pull ups and kettlebell circuits keeping my heart rate between 120 and 150 beats per per minute. My other workout, and I'll emphasize this, if folks out in the audience, if you're serious about jiu-jitsu and you're not doing solo drills on your own, I really recommend that you do. So my second workout was a mobility and uh, jiu-jitsu solo drill workout. And, And mainly trying to make sure that I'm keeping my back mobile, you know, keeping my hips and my psoas um, moving and gliding easily. So I focused on that, kind of taking it a little bit easy that day. But I did a lot of leg pummeling, leg scissoring, guard retention, uh, emulation, uh, shrimping, bridging, shoulder rolling, and inversions, to name a few. And man, that, that, it, it, every time that I kind of forget doing that stuff on my own, I, I kick myself in the butt. So that was a, a, a good session. And it, it works the heart rate up, too. If you do it right, I mean, you can you can certainly get your heart rate up for sure. So jiu-jitsu this week, um, we primarily worked on submission escapes. And I think that's something that sometimes gyms don't do enough of. And our instructor, Lee, um, brought it with some some really good uh, submission escapes. So that was a lot of fun. But kind of the highlight of the week with, with jiu-jitsu was we had Black Friday open mat. And the emphasis was black geese was, was the theme. That's and so, cool. I, yeah, I thought it was cool as well. <coughs> Sorry about that, buddy. And so, yeah, we... We did some, you know, work on the side. Myself and, uh, excuse me, myself, Chris, my buddy down the street. We worked some top lock, arm lock, and triangle setup stuff, and then got some excellent rolls with some awesome people. Some folks that I hadn't met before. Um, real safe rolls, um, purple and brown belts. It was it was a lot of fun. So, burn off a little bit of that turkey and and uh, what. Uh, green bean casserole and stuffing stuff I normally don't eat but I certainly dug in on that I'm sure she probably had some of the same most but yeah certainly. that was that was a that was a lot of fun and so <coughs> goodness so for dry fire you know Aaron you know my son Nick real well you know he's a solid shooter um solid and in jiu-jitsu and combatives and um when he was growing up it was tough to get him to dry fire (laughs) it's a oh dad i don't really want to do that you know and and so again being a uh, now he's a marine corps um, firearms instructor you know that's a big part of the program yeah and and also he's helping us teach classes doing an awesome job and 
he and I um, did a did a fun dry fire session um, this last week where I showed him how I was breaking down the draw stroke and reloads in micro drills and encompassing it all together. And also I showed him some of the the trigger the trigger drills that I've been working based on some of the the, the instruction on the bigger circle vi bigger circle videos that we talked about in the interview and and using the, the shot timer to to compress the time was was really enlightening for him. And so he told me, I was like, Dad, I you know, I realize I enjoy dry firing. Um, but this dry fire session really showed me how fun it can be. And, oh, I forgot to dig digress. I showed him a, a transition drill on all my scaled down targets. So it was a lot of fun. And just to have him around for that was was really cool. Excellent. Well, man, I, I think that does it for me, man. What you got? Well, so, you know, the last couple of weeks, um, I haven't been able to do a whole lot because um, I think we've talked about it in the last episode that I was having cataract surgery. And unfortunately, what that means is you don't think about it until you have that surgery that, that you can't, you're not supposed to lift over 10 pounds for a week and you're not supposed to bend over a bunch below waistline. So just to be super careful, because what happens, it can, they don't suit your eye, but it's interesting the way they cut it with the laser, it seats back in itself, but you have to be real careful not to pop it out. Like even blowing your nose real hard can, can pop those um, incisions. So for the last couple of weeks, I hadn't gotten much done, but what I um, was able to do um Excuse me, one thing, that because of that, I've had a couple of gigs and one of my buddies, his name is Rich, he had to lug all my gear around for a little bit. So appreciate <laughs> you doing that, Rich, just making sure you know I'm thinking about you and you don't have to do it anymore. As of this week, I can carry my own gear. So beyond that, um, last night I was able to um, hit my stationary bike. I just hit that for 30 minutes. And then right after that, I got five minutes of dry fire, and that was primarily draws from concealment um, appendix, of course. And then I did some transition practice between a couple of B8s. And let's see here. And as of tonight, I'm starting intermittent fasting again. It's, you, you know, that's... Me both. Yeah, just to be frank, you know, with my wife's surgery and my surgery, it's kind of thrown the discipline off, just to be frank. And so I need to get back on it. And that was that started yesterday. Now, I was able to hit the range with my oldest son this last weekend. We had a lot of fun because, you know, I... Um, I have a Glock that I put together and, and, you know, it's mine, it's in the safe, but, you know, it's his, you know, it's his Glock, he gets to go shoot. And he was real excited to get to do that. And for the first time, we shot his, now you're going to, he's going to kick my butt, but he's got a, a prototype Remington auto-loading shotgun from like 1905 that his grandpa restored and gave to him. And so we shot that a little bit, and that, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, Aaron, I'll just add, um, when I was there last, um, when we hosted Cecil, um, he was real proud of that shotgun. He brought it out and showed it to me. I was I was real glad for him. He, You could tell he really enjoys that. Oh, yeah. he, he We hadn't got to shoot it yet, <coughs> and so... Finally, he got to shoot it, and he had a lot of fun. So now let me talk back to, um, that's about it on my accountability this week, but interesting enough, so I, I was at the eye doctor today, and she said, Eric, check this out, I'm beyond three feet, I am seeing 2015 in both of my eyes. 
Man, that is awesome, Aaron. Uh, it's it's wild. Um, I haven't. I don't know if I've ever seen like this. You know, I must have been a little boy when I could see like this. But here at forty eight years old, to have that kind of vision, it's it's pretty awesome. Uh, I can see the crosshairs on my scopes detail that I never even noticed on my on my Vortex three to fifteen. That's on my bolt gun. I I didn't even know on the on the mill dots there and the let's call it the Christmas tree right. Um, there's numbers on there that I never even could see before. So it, real exciting that I can see all that detail now. But here here is the kicker, and I mentioned it on the last show. But as of today, my my doctor, who by the way is a shooter, also she. Cool. She said, finally, I just said, okay, am I ever going to be able to use iron sights again? And she said, Aaron, no, your vision will improve a little bit more, but it's never going to be good enough for you to trust um, at any responsible level to run iron sights. So I am going to have to, my favorite, my favorite small carry pistol is a is a Glock 42, which is 380, and and um, I had to look around for some places that would even mill on it, but I found um, you know CNH that makes those really cool plates, which um, which you put one of those on a Glock MOS, it really soups it right up. But they they verify with me today that they do that milling. And I have ordered a Holosun 507K, which is their smaller one. And I'm going to get that milled for that. And I'm going to be running three different dots on all my, on my, both my carry pistols and my training pistol. So kind of cool. I'm, I'm kind of bummed about not being able to use irons. I really like keeping that small pistol sleek without anything else but the irons. But, you know, again, it'd be irresponsible of me to, walk around with something that I can't make solid hits on. Well, Aaron, you know, it's interesting to me, but you, you can see the dot perfectly clear. Oh my you know? gosh. For, for some reason, I don't know what the difference is. And, and my doctor did say today, cause I told her about how, you know, I could clearly see that dot. And she said, well, our eyes see red really well. For some reason, and man, that mm -hmm. must be why they started using red dots, right? Could be because I mean the technology and and the knowledge that we have of, I guess you know, um, eye science that that red really stands out to humans. So she said it's in the daytime. In the nighttime, she said you go to you go more to your cones. You've got your rods and your cones on your retina. <coughs> And I guess when we go to cones, we don't see red as well at night. But I guess that's another story. Just kind of interesting. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to be good to go. It's ridiculous how well I can see my red dots. It's ridiculous how well I can see through my scopes. Um, small trade-off with the, without the irons and having to wear glasses to work on the computer. <coughs> so, man, that's, that's what I got this week. Awesome, Aaron. I'm I'm real glad for you, man. Sorry about all the coughing. <laughs> hey, that's all right. Um, well, brother, I, I think that does it. This is probably going to be a, a fairly lengthy show, but that's okay. Um, I think there's a lot to it, and 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 a lot of information, and and also, man, you know, our audience members like to hear accountability, and and uh, we get interaction on that, so um, we want to make sure that we're getting that in on a fairly regular basis. So, well, man, I, I think let's let's go ahead and call it an evening. All right, buddy, you have a good night. 